Native Americans say a strange beast lurks in the swamps of the southern United States. Our elders say that they are to be respected and that they are to live in peace. History supports the possibility that the skunk ape exists. Kind of like stretched up and expanded its chest and just stood there. If there were an orangutan in this picture, I think I'd be able to tell. People have claimed that you can smell it before you see it. Now, science explores the probability in a quest for answers. I developed the pheromone ship to hopefully lure this creature out from the wild. There's no way to get away from a bloodhound. Eventually, that dog will find you. It's just a matter of time. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. From the tip of the Florida Everglades through Louisiana's swamps and bayous and into the big thicket preserve of eastern Texas, there are 1,650,000 acres of connected, mostly impenetrable forests and swamps, larger than the state of Delaware. As long as people have lived here, they have told stories of a strange beast lurking in the swamps. But what are people seeing? In our language, they're called ishtizapko, means that it's a tall person who lives in the forest. When they were near you, you could smell a certain uh, sweet odor, and, uh, and those were also there, but also uh, sounds. Long before the first white man set foot in the area, the Miccosukee and Seminole tribes of southern Florida spoke of a creature they called Sti Chapchoki, or tall, hairy man. We don't feel that it's important to go and try to capture them or locate them. They, for one, are not bothering anyone. And our elders say that they have always been there and that they are to be respected and that they are to live in peace. In 1850, an Arkansas newspaper headline first made reference to the skunk ape. Farmers in the county reported a wild man covered in hair. Footprints measured 13 inches long. In South Pittsburgh, Tennessee, a 1934 newspaper headline reported a mysterious creature that was fast as lightning and jumped like a giant kangaroo. The monster's strange odor permeated many of the historic eyewitness descriptions. People have seen something that is real. Most of these people are not making it up. This is not a hallucination. They're not imagining it. So we have to come to terms with the fact that there's something very real out there. To me, that's something that can't be ignored, and obviously it begs for an explanation. When they exited the water, you heard a whoa. He had a kind of a conical-shaped head. He was very, very stout. In my opinion, um, it will be found to be some sort of released or escaped exotic, such as a chimpanzee, gorilla, orangutan. He stayed upright. He walked, his arms swung like a human's would swing. It was you know, kind of shaped like a monkey. It squatted like a monkey. And you know, when it took off, it ran kind of like a monkey do does. Most eyewitnesses describe a creature that stands six to seven feet tall, reddish in color, with long stringy hair, half man, half ape. Its most common and unique feature, the smell, a pungent odor similar to rotting eggs. It is often called the skunk ape, but where's the proof? If I'm looking at the photo, I see some possibilities of it actually being a real animal. The only close-up pictures of the alleged skunk ape arrived at the Sarasota City, Florida Police Department on December 22, 2000. The envelope contained an anonymous letter and these two photographs, which appeared to be shot in quick succession of an ape-like creature. The eyewitness who wrote the letter feared that an orangutan was running loose in the area of Mayaka State Park and might harm members of her family. The only thing I could really say if I looked at it is if it were a real animal, it looks more like an orangutan than anything else. Crystal LeMaster is a primate expert specializing in orangutans at the Miami-Dade Zoo. 
Lemaster has agreed to examine the photo. In the photo that I was shown, the creature appears to be baring his teeth. Orangutans don't usually show their teeth first um, when they're trying to intimidate whoever it is that is approaching them. They usually throw branches, um, a lot of branch thrashing, a lot of movement, a lot of noise. Apparently a lot of the locals there have described this animal as having a very foul odor to it. Other primate species do actually have what we call scent glands where they actually excrete an odor from those glands. That's not really the case with orangutans. But it's a big animal. I'm not sure that if people are really out there visiting the Everglades that they wouldn't spot it more often. Lemaster does not believe the subject in the photo is an orangutan. Lemaster's next step will be an even closer examination to see if the image is a real animal or a clever hoax. The swamp creature in Florida is a very different kind of phenomenon, yet very similar to the kinds of sightings that people have heard of for years from the Pacific Northwest and from Canada. Robert Carr is an archaeologist with the state of Florida's Division of Historic Resources and with the National Park Service. Carr has heard many eyewitness accounts and has researched the skunk ape phenomenon. Now what's similar is that it's a bipedal, hairy uh, type creature, allegedly. Uh, living in the Pacific Northwest in a, in a mountainous terrain, but here in a very low swampy area. The comparison to Bigfoot sightings of the Pacific Northwest is not uncommon. However, the swamp creature is reddish in color as opposed to the dark colored brown or black furred Bigfoot. The skunk ape also has much longer flowing hair and is smaller in size than Bigfoot reports. Another researcher agrees. From what I gather, Pacific Northwest are a little bit bigger, bulkier, a lot taller, um, and they're well suited for the terrain that they're in. And in the south, we don't have as rugged as climbing mountains and, and whatnot, so they don't have to be as, as powerful. The skunk ape's unique size, color, and smell all seem to point to a different animal. And this man claims he has seen it. <laughs> Collier County, Florida, 1983. I was in Collier County, Florida, hog hunting, and I was walking through the sawgrass looking for this trail when I happened to look up, and about a, 100 to 120 yards ahead of me, I saw a dark object. So I started stalking closer to this thing that I thought was a bear. I got within, I estimate, about 30 yards away, and I stood up straight to get a shot. It stood up and turned at the waist, its entire upper torso, and looked at me. This was when everything went haywire. This thing looked at me for what I can only estimate to be about eight to 10 seconds, and then it turned and walked into the bay head. And it walked on two legs. It never went down to all fours. And that's when the smell hit me. It was an awful smell. It would almost gag you. I have compared it over the years to rotten eggs, sulfur, and an old, wet, long-haired dog that's been sleeping in a goat pen all night in the rain. There are countless thousands of acres of swampland between Big Cypress and the Everglades. Um, it is not unimaginable for an animal to remain secluded in that area without ever being seen by a human being. Ron McGill is a zoologist at the Miami-Dade Zoo and believes the swamps of the southern U.S. can support a wide variety of animals. You know, you go down to the Everglades, there's a visitor coming in there looking into the National Park. It's a beautiful, endless area, um, serene quite calming in many ways. It's okay if you're in a vehicle and you're traveling down there looking at it as a national park. If you were to get lost in the Everglades, if you were to get lost in the Big Cypress Swamp, you're facing a lot of challenges. While these vast swamps could support a large ape, there are no non-human primates indigenous to the southern United States. <music> 150 miles from Shreveport, Louisiana, near Cotton Island, in the heart of the Louisiana Bayou, an expedition is underway. We got to meet, huh? Hey. Well, Cotton Island is a good site for an expedition because there's been sightings here, and there's been vocalizations, knocking, 
And it's also a very dense, swampy area where um, a larger creature could live and not really be seen by humans. And there's a lot of wildlife. There's uh, things for it to eat. Uh, behind me, there's a bunch of choke cherries. Well, I get asked a lot if I believe in a large North American ape, but I think belief is not really the, the question. That uh, stems more from something you think is true when you really don't have the evidence or facts to support it, and that's more faith-based. I think in science what we have to do is develop a hypothesis and then develop uh, data and evidence to support or refute that hypothesis. Dr. Greg Bambinek is a medical doctor and wildlife biologist with 35 years experience developing hunting and fishing scents to attract wildlife. Bambinek believes scents may help in his search for the skunk ape. So I've developed a pheromone ship to hopefully lure this creature out from the wild. A pheromone is any chemical produced by a living organism that transmits a message to other members of the same species. The pheromone ship scent that I've uh, come up with is a combination of uh, human ape pheromones and copulins, and it has a fairly rude odor. Bambinek developed the pheromone ships using vaginal bacteria from both human and ape females, creating a combination that should arouse the curiosity of any ape lurking within miles. Woo, that's bad. Bambinek will be joined by researcher Scott Kessler. Kessler was raised in Louisiana and brings his knowledge and experience of these swamps to the expedition. I believe this is a good site for an expedition just because of the previous history. Um, you've got a lot of uninhabited area, a lot of swamp lands that's really hard to get into. In August 2000, near Trout, Louisiana, about 235 miles from New Orleans. Paramedics and then police were called out to the scene of an accident. A driver had reportedly hit someone or something. While the driver did not want to be interviewed, one firefighter at the scene that night recounts his story. He too, does not want his identity known. Uh, we arrived on scene, uh, walked up to the, the vehicle, expecting to see somebody laying on the ground under the vehicle or within pro, uh, close proximity. And uh, there's nobody there. The driver of the vehicle stated that he struck what he appeared to be a man wearing a fur coat uh, crossing the highway. There was a significant amount of damage to the driver's side of the vehicle. Uh, remember the mirror being torn off, and there was a, a lot of hair along the side of the vehicle. If he had struck something, or what, we don't know. Um, we searched the nearby woods and the uh, ditches, and we weren't able to find anything. The damage to the front quarter panel of the car indicated something large was hit. Police wanted to find him or her. Bloodhounds were brought in to track the victim, who perhaps wandered off in a daze. The bloodhounds picked up a scent and chased the victim through a thick, rugged, swampy terrain for over two hours. They could hear something large moving through the thicket just ahead of them, but were never able to get close enough to see it before losing the scent and the victim into the swamp. It was just peculiar. That much damage was done to a vehicle and uh, had to find no patient. Dr. Greg Bambinek and researcher Scott Kessler are focusing their search near Cotton Island Swamp only about 20 miles from the Trout, Louisiana incident in 2000. Scott, have you got that aimed over to the vicinity of this ship? Yeah, we're, we're right on. Aim right on? Okay. Got our angle for the angle. We're good to go. I hunt elk and bear and even jaguar in the past. Scent is widely used for that, so why not use it to uh, lure in a great ape? While Bambinek and Kessler deploy stealth cam digital camera traps and pheromone chips on high ground, 
the rest of the crew sets out deeper into the swamp. Accessible only by airboat, these dangerous and remote waterways contain small islands and other lowlands that some researchers believe may be home to the skunk ape. bait the log out there, put our camera, set up our camera on this tree, we pick up the whole white prairie out there. Bambinek's goal, cover as much territory as possible, increasing his chances of an encounter with the elusive beast. Number one. If you can hold that there, yeah, let me hold on to it. Bambinek search area has a long history of sightings, including a recent report in 2006. In August, uh, I had a logging crew in there. Guy was driving and stopped, and he said this shaggy dog thing stood up. He said it was completely covered in black hair. He said, couldn't see any face or features. And ended up, it run off and ended up jumping into a bay and swimming off. A few days later, him and another guy were walking survey line and he said he looked up along the, the line and he said he saw this thing leaning over looking at it behind a tree he said they hollered at it and said it turned and it went back toward their logging equipment that they had just got off of i've come back out here we uh we measured the tracks for that day we found 16 tracks um i think they measured 14 inches It is here that Babinek and Kessler want to try something else, a low-tech but very effective scent tool. Good seeing you guys. Bloodhounds, the dogs that tracked someone or something in 2000. Bloodhounds have been, you know, around for many, many years and used specifically for trailing and tracking. Tracking is following a specific scent step by step. Uh, if this person went this way, that dog is going to go right where that person stepped. John Prater and Kerry Foster are the dog handlers from the Shreveport Fire Department Search and Rescue. In trailing, it's doing somewhat the same thing, but with air currents, as that scent may travel or collect, the, do the person may have gone that way and then turned to where in trailing, the dog may cut off, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes off of the trail, but still be on the uh, scent and follow that person. If other people have been out in the woods, or if the scent they has been contaminated, we introduce that dog to everybody that is going to be around uh, during that trail so that the dog also understands that this is not the person I'm looking for and he knows that specific scent. Bloodhounds only detect living flesh or fresh skin cells. So when the pheromone chips with live ape bacteria are presented to the dogs, a live ape becomes their target. Critics argue if there are living apes, then there should also be dead apes. Wildlife expert Peggy Callahan plans an experiment that could shed light on why no carcass has been found. People always want to hear about how they live. Equally important to a scientist is how animals die and what happens beyond their death. There's so much exciting information to be learned just by watching one deer. Peggy Callahan and photographer Jim Tittle want to see how long it takes for a large animal carcass to decompose. This is our time-lapse camera housing. It's a waterproof camera case made out of plastic. In order to accommodate the camera, we've cut a hole right here in the side um, and attached a clear glass filter for the camera to look through. They have acquired a fresh roadkill deer carcass for the test fixed to the ground to prevent scavengers from carrying the deer away. For the most of the flesh and hair, et cetera, to disappear, I'm going to give it about a month. 
in this kind of weather, everything combined. For the bones, the bones will go to good use, but they'll be distributed across the countryside, across the landscape, and they'll disappear below, below leaf cover, below other plant life, etc. So we will not see evidence of this deer in two months. The camera will snap a picture of the carcass every 10 minutes for seven consecutive days. If the deer completely decomposes, it could explain why no dead skunk ape bodies are found, if they exist. Researcher Scott Kessler has never found physical evidence like bones, but Kessler does not need evidence to fuel his search. In 1977, near Trout, Louisiana, when he was just seven years old, Kessler says he encountered the skunk ape. And it was still real quiet, and I heard something hit the water. The really big thing that stands out that night was, was hearing the sound that was made when they came out of the water. Mwah. In 1977, Scott Kessler was just seven years old, camping with his family near Trout, Louisiana. Late that night, we was in camp. Everybody was asleep. Uh, we had lanterns burning for safety and security in the camp. I remember the raccoons would come into camp every night, mess with what was left on tables. And I woke up around midnight or so, set up and looked out the window. And all of a sudden, everything went real quiet. The coons started looking off into the woods like, hey, something big's coming. We need to, to respect it. And I looked back for the coons, and they were gone. And it was still real quiet. And I heard something hit the water. The really big thing that stands out that night was, was hearing the sound that was made when they came out of the water. Mwah. And then I heard it grunting coming up the embankment and it was about an eight foot embankment and when it stood up it kind of like stretched up and expanded its chest and just stood there i hunkered down where just my eyes were showing above the window opening and I saw it moved forward and then i heard something hit the water and I heard the same Wah! And it come up out of the water and a smaller one came up over the embankment that was all i needed to see and i laid down covered up and hope they like to get there pretty quick Kessler remains convinced the creatures he observed as a child were not a known animal, but others are not so sure. There's a long history of uh, monkeys and, and primates uh, uh, going wild in southern Florida. In 2006, this lone chimp was photographed near Gulf Breeze, Florida. The local zoo was contacted and all chimps were accounted for. In 1992, Hurricane Andrew ravaged Florida and Louisiana, releasing almost 300 dog-sized monkeys from the University of Miami Primate Center. Ron McGill believes the swamps of the southern U.S. could be home to escaped or released primates. There are countless thousands of acres of swampland between Big Cypress and the Everglades. Um, it is not unimaginable for an animal to remain secluded in that area without ever being seen by a human being. So I firmly believe that, yes, an animal could adapt, a primate, in fact, could adapt to survive in the Everglades. And eyewitnesses continue to see them, like Ron Mayberry, in the summer of 2005 in the heart of the Big Cypress Preserve. When I first, you know, was coming down the trail and I seen it, I didn't know exactly what it was, and uh, I stopped and just looked at it harder, and it presumed to me as like a monkey. It was. You know, kind of shaped like a monkey. It squ squatted like a monkey. And it, you know, when it took off, it ran kind of like a monkey do does. And, uh, you know, I really couldn't tell if it had a tail on it or not. It was, you know, shorter, but a little bulkier, bulkier like in the shoulders. And... While Mabry was not able to estimate the size of the primate he saw, an escaped chimpanzee does fit his description. But how does one explain this? There were sightings of apes in this region long before zoos or private collectors. There is one newspaper account from the early 19th century. 
Now this early 19th century newspaper account deals with what was called at the time the Man Mountain, which was supposedly this giant hair-covered half-human, half-ape monster that lived in the swamps of the Florida-Georgia border. At one point, two hunters are out uh, in, the, in the bottomlands in the swamp, and they find a track about 19 inches long and about nine inches wide, unlike anything they've ever seen. And these are hunters, these are woodsmen, uh, so they're justifiably startled. That night, as they camp, uh, suddenly they're woken up by these huge, horrendous, bellowing screams. And they very quickly take off, getting out of the swamp as fast as they can, even leaving some of their gear behind in their haste. We went on a hunt. Mm -hmm. we and once they get the back into civilization there, uh, the two guys begin to tell this story around. I first thought it was a human being that left the print, and then it had cold prints as well. Lots of people are intrigued. They describe the size of the tracks and the bellowing screams and all this sort of thing. And eventually, a party of, uh, of individuals, both from Georgia and Florida, gets together and they're going to go out and they're going to try to hunt this creature. And they are armed to the teeth with rifles and pistols and swords and all the weapons of the day. They set off into the woods there, into the swamps and the bottomlands. And they're out for, for quite some time, for like two weeks. So finally, after, after two weeks of frustrating effort and not really finding anything, they do find some tracks. And they make camp nearby and prepare to uh, look for the creature at first light. During the night, after everybody has dozed off and everybody's asleep, the camp is all quiet. And suddenly, they're actually attacked by this creature, uh, taken totally by surprise. And you can only imagine what it would be like to wake up to a, a 10, 12, 13 foot monster in your camp. Some of the guys manage to get up and grab firearms and get several shots off the creature is hit numerous times, but it still manages to kill uh, the majority of the party. And so they finish the creature off, and as they examine the creature's body in the dark, they find it to be this giant 13-foot-tall monster uh, with uh, huge muscles and just terrifying proportions. Uh, the survivors are fearful that the, uh, the commotion may attract other monsters, so they very quickly gather up some firearms and head out of the swamp, and of course they don't bother to take any part of the monster to actually verify their story, but the story was picked up by several other newspapers at the time. Just because you read it in the newspaper doesn't make it real. We know that in the 19th century that there were reporters actually making up really grandiose, bizarre stories. This could be one of them. But it's interesting because it does fit in with the more modern pattern of, uh, of this swamp creature and with footprints and a lot of similarities to, uh, to what is reported in the 20th century. Primate expert Crystal Lemaster has been studying the best photo of the alleged swamp creature. The question is, is it a hoax or a real animal? The hair looks pretty long for an orangutan and pretty manicured, so to speak. Um, an orangutan that's out there in the wild, you know, living by himself probably wouldn't be quite so manicured in those conditions. After looking at all the photos, I really have to question its authenticity, and it would be my professional opinion that this is not a real animal. For most experts, the Mayaka ape photos present problems. Without an interview with the person who took them, the context and veracity of the photos cannot be fully investigated. While interesting, they are not conclusive. However, another Florida tracker, T.L. Riggs, has found something intriguing. The art of tracking is the art 
of finding something out of place. And in order to know if something is out of place in the wild or anywhere else, you have to know from experience where everything belongs. Riggs has 60 years experience working as an animal tracker and surveyor in Florida. He found something in the Everglades that bears closer examination. The first time I uh, came on to Hare was on an abandoned rock road. I noticed a broken branch and I noticed that uh, where it was broken off at first glance it looked like it had spiderweb on it but looking closer I determined it wasn't spiderweb it was hair very fine kinky not straight copper colored hair. Riggs hair sample has never been examined by outside experts until now. These are the individual hairs that we're going to send off to have further analysis done on. Dr. Lynn Rogers is a wildlife biologist. He will conduct a morphology exam, a simple means of determining if the hair comes from a known creature. It's a little over an inch long, tapers to a tip, uh, and uh, it's uh, like it's been broken in a few places. I'm not sure what it is. There is something strange about this hair. It doesn't match the morphology of hair. It's, uh, it's uh, got several breaks in it. Uh, it's just, it's not a hair. I don't see any scale pattern on this at all. So I would suspect that this is plant material and I can't identify what species it is. There's so many fungi and lichens in Louisiana that it could be one of those. A dead end. And yet eyewitnesses continue to report seeing the creature. Like wildlife tracker Dan Jackson, who claims he came face to face with the monster in 2002 in a place nobody would think to look. I looked straight into his face and the face was just pure rage. In response to thousands of sightings, the Florida State Legislature in April 1977 introduced a bill to protect the elusive man-ape, which in part barred any person taking, possessing, harming, or molesting any anthropoid or humanoid animal which is native to Florida, popularly known as the skunk ape. The bill never passed into law, but that hasn't stopped discussions about trying it again. The bill was meant to protect the creature from violent encounters with man like the one Florida wildlife tracker Dan Jackson had in December of 2002. Jackson set a trap at an unlikely location behind a strip mall in Collier City, Florida, at a dumpster where he believes a skunk ape was lured by old fruit in the garbage. I had found a game trail and uh, had been working it for quite some time and found that it ended where this uh, little retention pond was with a series of six dumpsters. And I devised a plan to where I was going to use a half a gallon container of orange juice with a strong sedative that I had put into it. And I had put extra sugar in it to both enhance the smell and the taste. If he drank the orange juice with his sedative in it, I had him. I had closed all the dumpsters with the can tricks except for this one dumpster that I had the orange juice on. It was a long night that I started at about 9, 30, 10 o'clock. And being very quiet in the area, uh, it wasn't too long before I kind of dozed off for a little bit. I kind of awoke with a start. I heard a, a noise, a scraping noise, and as I looked up above the dumpster, I saw the creature, and he was looking directly at me. He put both hands on the edge of the dumpster, and his elbows started to come up, and at that time, I was afraid. 
I can't tell you how afraid I was. I reached for my weapon, drew, and fired. He leaped up out of the dumpster. My shot went into the dumpster and missed him. He hit the ground and ran between the dumpsters and was gone in two seconds flat. Jackson's story, while dramatic, did not yield any physical evidence to support his encounter. Back in Louisiana, Kessler and Bambinek have teamed up with the Shreveport Fire Department Search and Rescue Unit and their bloodhounds, hoping the ape pheromone scents will put the dogs on the trail of the skunk ape. Well, these are the pheromone chips that have been impregnated with ape uh, copulins and, and pheromones. Some of them are airborne pheromones or uh, fatty acids that are, are vaginal secretions at the time of ovulation or estrus. Uh, let's get Joe to swap those over into his bag and then we'll go to the uh, front of the truck. I've got to cast the dog, which is to walk her around in a circle and that's just to collect the scents within the area. And anybody that's going to walk with us, we'll get her to uh, smell them. And at that point, I want to put the harness on her, then I'll introduce the scent and we'll go on the trail from that point on. The dog's nose is very strong. It's got a moist lining in the nose. They salivate more than the other dogs. The ears are designed to collect scent, actually create a venturi effect around the nose and the, the tongue being moist, they taste it, they smell it. In my opinion, there's no other better dog than a bloodhound. It is not long before the dogs pick up a scent. But in this case, it is another primate, man, a crew member out installing camera traps. The trackers will work into the night, hoping to cross a scent trail. Meanwhile, Bambinek and Kessler want to try something else that could bring the skunk ape to them. Becky, in one minute, we're going to run a given call. He's going to do one blast at half volume and we'll wait five minutes and see if we can get, we'll wait and get, see if we can get a response for 30 minutes, 45 minutes. What calls do you have? What, you, you do have the Gibbons, right? Yeah, I've got. Because I've got my Gibbons if, if it's cleaner than what you've got. Primates like chimpanzees, Gibbons and gorillas are known to defend their territory. The researchers hope call blasting will bring an animal within range of the dogs. They are also prepared to record any return calls. Vocalizations and pictures may provide supporting evidence, but what about physical evidence, like a dead carcass? The time-lapse experiment is done. I have never seen anybody take a, a time-lapse start to finish documentation of the decomposition or disappearance of a, of a deer or an animal like that in the woods. It's really a neat process. Many of us have put carcasses out there and then have come every day to try to read the signs, but this gives us a chance to see it, everything that happens from start to finish. It's, it's, it's an exciting process. Well, now the time-lapse sequence has started. For centuries, eyewitnesses in and around the swamps of the southern United States have reported a creature that seems to look similar to known primates. This man says he shot at the creature but he collected no evidence. I can't tell you how afraid I was. I reached for my weapon, drew, and fired. This man saw it in 2005 and said it looked like a monkey. This man says he saw an animal when he was just seven years old. This is considered the best photo of the skunk ape, but a Monster Quest examination suggests it's a fake. Why is there no physical evidence? like a carcass of a primate population that has survived hundreds of years. 
Wildlife expert Peggy Callahan and photographer Jim Tittle have set up an experiment to see just how long it takes for the remains to disappear. Callahan is viewing the time lapse for the first time. I would imagine that everything from raccoons to skunks to make uh, coyotes, bear, etc., um, have the potential to make a visit. Perhaps a few domestic animals, two cats, dogs, because uh, it's going to smell. Uh, it's, and it's here in August. It's a free meal. Uh, in addition to all the bugs and things that we'd expect to come and eat on this thing during this week, so that's what I would look to see in in, in the next in this footage. This funny scene has a, a little possum that took a quick look and and decided against eating. It looks like, and is, as time goes on, we have flies showing up all of a sudden. The decomposition's making this deer um, bloat up pretty fast and pretty hard. It looks like we've got all kinds of of bug activity down here. Oh, and the maggots are, are taking over and are gonna make short work of that. Look at the maggots. Wow. And then the maggots leave. When they're done, they leave. That's just amazing. So they take their meal and they move on and, and become flies somewhere else. How efficient is that? That's amazing. That is just an incredible display. The time-lapse experiment does yield some new insight. Callahan estimated it would take at least a month for the carcass's hair and flesh to be removed, making the remains mostly unrecognizable. In this case, Mother Nature's smallest creatures did the job in only seven days. The remaining pile of bones would either be quickly covered by foliage or carried off by larger scavengers, leaving only traces of the corpse and the victim unidentifiable to all but the most experienced eye. I would imagine that a carcass in an even more um, humid, moist environment with even more bugs and more um, opportunities for, for mold and decomposition would go quickly, like the Everglades, for example. There would be less left, in my opinion, after a week in a moist environment. Back in Louisiana, the dog handlers have returned without success the dogs were never able to pick up a fresh scent. And what about the camera traps, baited with eight pheromone chips? If you can get the video and then have the collaborating evidence, track finds, and, and all that to substantiate it would, would be awesome. really hard to tell. After viewing dozens of images, nothing resembling the skunk ape is found. Even though there have been hundreds of sightings over many decades, science does not support the skunk ape's existence, at least for now. I mean, we've used a lot of technology. Uh, we've used uh, the dogs, the pheromone chips, the, the call blasting, the knocking. And, you know, maybe we didn't come up with the, the creature right here, but this shows the kind of research that we have to do to, to gather more information, more data for that file, so that mainstream science is going to take more of a look at this. Overall, I think we had a good expedition. We got, had some success. Probably didn't get too much of the evidence that we needed, but we will one day. But for the many eyewitnesses, the swamp creature is very real. I'm trying to think what in the world did I just see? I knew it wasn't a bear, and I knew it wasn't any other animal indigenous to Florida. And if you had asked me up to that time, do you, what do you think about this creature? I would have told you that this is uh, something made in Hollywood. But humans really need to, uh, to rub shoulders against the with the unknown. They need to feel that there is more to life than what is visible and what is part of everydayness. And I think this phenomena represents that in very compelling uh, desire to look beyond uh, the edge of the known world and see what shouldn't be seen.